Talking to Death is released weekly, every Wednesday, and brought to you absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus at tenderfootplus.com or on Apple Podcasts. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcasts. Listener discretion is advised. And we're back. Talking to Death. I'm going to go ahead and just say this. Spoiler alert. If you are listening to Up and Vanished, then there's spoilers coming if you haven't listened to episode four yet. Um, assuming you have, in these intro segments during the Up and Vanished season, we're going to be talking about the most recent episode. This week, it's episode four. Things are, are shaping up here. Um, again, I think I want to kick to Dylan to help me set this up. Oh boy, my head's all kind of mixed up now. This episode's been interesting because you've introduced this entirely new theory for the first time. We've been going on this idea that Oregon John is the main culprit, and he may still be. It's very likely. Uh, it seems like this new theory still ties him in. But there's a, there's a larger world that's opening up here, more conspiracy, more intrigue in a completely different direction. What can you tell us about this new theory? From pretty much, it feels like day one, we have only heard about this guy named Oregon John. But there are some basic cold hard facts that make him extremely central here. One of the last people to see her, if not the very last person to see Flo, he had her things in his tent on West Beach. He's been seen by witnesses allegedly driving Flo away from West Beach on his four-wheeler that night and then coming back super late in the morning without her. The, if you're looking at Flo's last steps and what she was doing in those moments before she disappeared, it seems like John is a part of all of it, unless we're missing some sort of big link here. And so really until this point, when Sue reached out to me, there had been really no other theory as to what may have happened to her that night. And so she brings up these text messages that she was sent. And I've since gone through and I've, I've validated and verified that these are definitely real. And how she received them, I traced it all the way back. They're legitimate. And there's this person, there's this girl um, who I'm that we're calling Kelly for now. Um, this is We're getting to the part of the investigation where we're exploring a lot of the rumor mill. But the thing about it is sometimes the rumor mill is actually what the hell happened. And so on multiple occasions, this girl who we're calling Kelly was texting different people claiming to have intimate knowledge as to what happened to Flo that night. And she brings up this group of people. Now, John is associated with this group of people, but for whatever reason, she seems to kind of leave out John's name specifically in a lot of these texts, even though I know for a fact that the group that she's talking about, these people hung out together. And it just for the first time sort of poses the idea that what if John is just the most unlucky guy in the world, right? What if he's just the unluckiest guy in the world? And he had her things, but she left his tent and she went somewhere else with these other gentlemen and somehow died in the process. And so it just kind of makes you scratch your head and wonder, one, if Kelly is telling the truth, which that was quickly up for debate by people that we've talked to, even Sue herself said, not all of it kind of adds up and sort of contradicts itself. And so this is something that you really have to pick apart because so far, everything that has to do with Oregon John, for the most part, it does make sense. Besides hearing John's testimony himself, everything that points to him from tons of different people, all seem to make a pretty clear narrative. But I'm also curious, you know, what you guys think or what your takeaway is from what Sue was saying and those those texts from Kelly. I mean, the texts are wild. Why would somebody just all of a sudden start saying this? I mean, if you have information, yeah, bring it forward. But 
is this just weighing on you and that's why you're getting it off your chest? Or is this some kind of muddying the waters? Like what is going on with this? It, it's weird because it's like, when did this happen? When did these messages happen? And why, why now, you know? Well, that, that's actually a good point because the when the messages happened is actually pretty important here. The, the first messages I saw were from Sue and I verified that they were real. These messages that were sent out to different people from Kelly, who's the, the only person here who's claiming that these things happened to flow that night that involved these other people, right? These were sent a couple of years after the fact. And so a part of you starts to wonder, okay, why didn't this person come forward sooner? Is this sort of the the rumor mill getting out of control? Is this people just grasping at straws? Does she have some, some sort of vendetta against somebody? You know, what's the motivation behind this and why now, right? But then when I talked to one of Flo's friends who will remain anonymous, she sent me other messages from Kelly from way earlier than the ones that I saw with Sue. And they were different. And the biggest takeaway I had from the messages Flo's friend sent me was that Kelly was saying John was a part of this. John and this other individual. So I'm just confused as to how in the process of a couple of years, the narrative went from John being central in Kelly's theory to him being left off of the theory entirely when she's texting people years later. And I, I just, to me, that's suspicious that it makes you wonder, one, is it true at all? Two, is there a specific reason that she's not including John in these messages? Right. Yeah, that's the thing. Why would her why would her story change these years later? What is her motivation for telling anyone in this? That's what I want to know. Or is she doing this to get the pressure off of her? Mm -hmm. Off of her like weighing her down? Or is this she's trying to leak some information to get stuff moving? But why would her story change so many years later? Mm-hmm. I would tend to believe the the messages from earlier with Flo's friend. I, I would almost always lean more into the testimony or witness statements or whatever was said by anyone right after things happened. So I put more value into the messages Kelly sent to Flo's friend freshly after Florence was reported missing. Because that is that's so early on that nobody should really be assuming that she could be dead at all unless there was some other knowledge you had about a suspicious circumstance or you saw her die or you saw her deceased body. It sounds like she's saying she was right next to Florence's body. She doesn't do anything to clear up the fact that that wasn't what she was saying. Now, she doesn't explicitly say that literally, but the implication is pretty clear to me, I think, that she she believes that she was around Flo after she was deceased and they wouldn't let her back into this tent. What the hell is she talking about? Why would you even say that if it was completely bogus? Yeah, I, f I feel like you wouldn't bring up the tent and in the way that she did, if she didn't feel some sort of like dread or terror about what was inside the tent. Now, the, the thing we, everybody needs to know or somebody needs to confess to is how did she become that way, right? We have the call with her in the bushes, which is a big deal. And then after, I assume after, her friend is talking about not being let into the tent. So what happened between that call and her not being let in the tent. And, and I know that I'm not the police. I know that nobody has an obligation to talk to me in any way, shape, or form. And I, I, I'm taking that into consideration with what I'm about to say. But if you look at all the players that we've learned of so far, 
people who've made statements like this, Kelly is the only one who seems to be intentionally dodging me. I mean, on multiple occasions over several weeks in several different circumstances, pretends to me like she wants to help and then flakes out at the end in a way that doesn't really even seem that genuine to me is the problem. And that's just my opinion there. But I have nothing else to go off of other than my interactions with her. And I feel like if what she is saying is entirely true and she's saying it from a place that, where she wants to help find out what happened to Flo and solve this murder, then her behavior would be different. She, she's made some very big claims on record and it's documented in several different places by tons of different people. I, I would just... I would think that someone who said those kinds of things would feel some sort of moral obligation to speak to that. You know, looking at the bigger picture, you know, I think the real value that Up and Vanish can bring in terms of making a positive impact and pushing this case forward in some way is that we're learning a lot of new information and we're trying to shake down what's true, what isn't. And, you know, what's hiding in here? And I, I think that the most that we can do, because we can't arrest anybody. I can't arrest anybody. Anybody could come, anybody in this case could come confess to me and prove it. But I couldn't do anything about it other than telling the listeners, telling the public, telling you guys, and telling the police. That's really it, right? And so I think that looking at the bigger picture, we're just going to keep collecting all this information and put it out there. And with this information, we're also going to put pressure on the people who have the power and ability to do stuff about it. What can uh, viewers look forward to from episode five? Can you give us a little taste? Well, there's always been, you know, since the beginning, Oregon John has been what started out as, to me, almost like this mythical, is he even real character, right? Turns out he's very real. Turns out he's very bad. You know, everyone said he fled town, been gone for a long time, long gone, right? What people have said to us is that they think he's in the Philippines. These are faraway places that, if that's where he really is, good luck ever talking to him, really. But... After learning his full name and having some more information on this individual, we were able to do some legitimate internet searching. Turns out he's not in the Philippines. He's right here in Alaska. It's time for me to go find him and talk to him. Today's guest is one of my good friends. His name is Jason Hoke. I met him in the middle of producing season one of Up and Vanished years ago. And we've had so many long, deep, nuanced discussions about true crime, making investigative podcasts, podcasting in general. We have a really deep conversation about making these shows and digging into this really heavy content. I think it's a really unique insight into how these shows are made and sort of the collaboration part of it too. He's been following Up and Vanished every week, just like you all, I hope. And so he was up to date on exactly where episode four ended. I actually let him hear it early because I wanted to talk to him on Talking to Death. Here's my interview with Jason Hoke. Jason, man, we're here. We're here, yeah. We did it. <laughs> we're done. Yeah. Mic drop. How are you feeling? Great. You know, I think you and I talk all the time in really weird incarnations, right? Yeah. Um, 
we come up for air every two or three weeks or two or three right. months or it's still alive over there. Okay, it's, cool. Yeah. It's a text at four in the morning. Yeah. Like check this art out or whatever it is. It's always some or we'll hang. nugget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we've never done this. Mm -mm. Never sat down like a interview style thing. Yeah. We've had plenty of conversations like this. Yeah. Off, <laughs> off mic. <laughs> I, exactly. Yeah. That's great. It, to me, it's always a funny story looking back and we, we've told it several times to different people how we met yeah. I, I want you to retell the story of how we met from your perspective back in the day yeah so we were at pont city market here in atlanta actually just right down from where we are in the studio right now mm -hmm. and we were the second tenants behind mailchimp and still a pretty empty building we were really excited about the space we built studios we had kind of everyone finally in the right home for how stuff works and i was leading that team at the time as chief content officer and I was really um, excited about the fact that podcasts were becoming a thing and we had real numbers and something was happening, right? Um, Serial had come out, so we, there was a validation that this was a big thing. Yeah. And we had Apple out for the first time. They actually came to Atlanta and did a little world tour. So Steve Wilson, James Boggs, they came by the office and hung out with us for an afternoon and we had lunch. And I remember, I think it was Steve said to me, we, we both know Steve, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. He says, um, oh, we have a we have to go upstairs to meet Payne. I'm like, what are you talking about upstairs? They're like, no, in this building, <laughs> there's this guy. I don't know if you've heard of Up and Vanished, <laughs> but he's upstairs. And have you listened to it? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> right, I yeah. was just in another zone. Of course, yeah. And uh, And then that was it. They left. And I got your contact info from one of the guys mm -hmm. uh, after a great visit. And I, I emailed you. It was pretty short. I was like, yeah. hey, I had no idea. Apple was here. I had no idea. I just picked up the first couple episodes up and vanished. Let's talk. Yeah. And what happened? I, I responded. What's funny is that Donald and I were looking for an office space. And this is in the middle of the first season of Up and Vanish. We're probably like, I don't know, 10 episodes yeah, in or something like that. I think you're right. I, I was binging. Like, I was trying to catch yeah, up. Yeah, like, so and it was, you know, in the thick of it. And this is, I think it might, it was, it was before the break in the case, maybe. I don't, I don't know which point it was at, but we were looking for office space and we went to Pawn City Market and we saw that How Stuff Works was there and we knew that How Stuff Works made podcasts. And I had like the silliest thought of like, well, I mean, if they're here, and they're making podcasts, and you know, maybe we we should be here too. It's not that silly of a thought, right? It, it, I guess in hindsight, now it wasn't, but like I, I wasn't really trying to. I was like, this seemed like a good path. And then, so you sent me that email, and then I went downstairs to meet you one day. And I remember walking into your office, and I realized once I sat down in the chair in front of your desk, I was like, it, "What am I doing here exactly? Like, what are we just like saying hey to each other?" And is this a job interview? Uh, <laughs> um, and we just started talking about what we were working on. And I don't remember how it came up. I, I want to say that you somehow mentioned the Atlanta child murders first. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then you were ready. You were like, yeah, yeah, us too. Because Donald and I had been talking about that case and Wayne Williams and the idea of doing a podcast series about that because I was blown away by the fact that I didn't. I'd never heard of the Atlanta child murders. And I was in my head at that point thinking that maybe the next podcast I do is not Up and Vanish season two. It's it's this other podcast about this. And you had mentioned that. And uh, we basically somehow eventually got to the point where we were collaborating on this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I was really hungry to start the kind of narrative version of how stuff works. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist. And I right. was, and I, I just fascinated about fresh original stories, like podcast narratives. Yeah, right. Yeah, like limited series. Right. Like what was going to shows be, in that sense? Yeah. Yeah. What was going to be our thing? That's kind of was kind of my jam, and I'm, I was just like, I want that. And yeah. so, I, you know, listen, I was a white kid growing up in Wisconsin. I was probably 11, 12 years old at the time that all this happened in Atlanta, but I remembered it, and it stuck with me. Um, but I never resolved that, mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to do something in our own backyard and and i just thought okay let's just do it let's just start making a true crime show about this and i discovered 
um, at University of Georgia at, in Athens, Georgia. They've got this amazing um, media lab. Yeah, They've taken WSB TVs, uh, which is one of the local TV stations here, who typically those stations have no idea how to organize themselves with their archives. Yeah, So they either don't do anything with them or they give it to someone else. Right. And so they wisely, you know, kind of gave that to a whole library service at uh, University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest kind of archives that they had was about the Atlanta child murders and Wayne Williams and everything. And it was absolutely stunning. You remember going downstairs in the in the this massive kind yeah, of library? It, it was something out of a movie. It, it was literally like a vault going down into the Harry Potter basement of some archive place and they once they transcoded and put all that stuff digitized it i mean i was up for hours every night watching these clips like living like i was in in, in the 70s here in incredible and i remember the main kind of librarian archivist saying we always knew someone would show up to do this story we just didn't know who and we didn't know when <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. It's really cool. Like it really touches like it, yeah, me. Yeah, it was. Yeah, like it wasn't all for nothing. Right. Like we really, and also we made good use of that tape. I mean, we really did. So <laughs> do you. So this is the unofficial official story about that. Um, they kind of didn't have their act together in terms of like, and this is still a little bit of the case today. What should we charge? What's the quantity? What's the per second? What this is yeah. what we have to deal with sometimes if we're not kind of dealing with fair yeah, use with archival stuff, right? Yeah. Like, so they know how to do video, but they've never done audio in podcasts before. So it was really kind of yeah. not familiar both for University of Georgia, the Brown Media Archives, yeah. but also WSB TV. There was no precedent for that. There was that, no really. precedent. And and so we did it. We actually paid a significant amount of money for that. But I heard later on from that same woman at WSB TV who we used, mm -hmm. um, I think for In the Red Clay and some other things that I worked on, uh, Gangster House, et cetera. She said... We should have probably charged you 10 times what we charged you. Oh, wow. So we were sitting on this kind of massive library. Right. And I think, you know, archives speak to something that the the um, the, the librarian said about, you know, we didn't know when and we didn't know who. Yeah. There's also the other, the flip side of this. Um, if no one shows up, then no one tells the story. Yeah. And, you know, the the story of the Atlanta child murders... And Wayne Williams and everything that's been down has kind of been out there for years, mm -hmm. but it hasn't. It's yeah. never really done the deep dive. I know Soledad O'Brien did, did a great piece yeah. for CNN, but kind of bringing that into the present day had never really been done. It's just sitting there. Yeah. It's just sitting. And I see this all the time. Yeah. In the red clay with the Dixie Mafia and, yeah. and you know, Stoney and, and his father. These things are just sitting there yeah. and time is passing so quickly that if we don't dig up all these amazing stories, they're just bound to be buried forever. And and I think Atlanta Monster is the perfect example of something that was kind of there. Mm -hmm. It was ready for a discussion. Yeah. And it just had all the pieces generationally, culturally, whatever, to do what it did. So how would you describe, because we, we've really built the Atlanta Monster, Atlanta Monster podcast together, right? Yeah. How would you describe <laughs> how it was working together on that and like the process of actually making that show? Wow, there's so many parts to this. Because like later on, like we we went into it making a show not knowing or even thinking that we could get Wayne Williams. Right. And then at a certain point, we did. And then we said, we don't want to tell the audience that we have Wayne Williams. You were actually very smart to say, yep. I think it was episode five, we brought him in. We have to hold people off. You know, I'm kind of in the position of if we don't hook people by that first or second episode, they may not stay with us. Yeah. They may not know this story. We need to bring we this. We got to hook them no matter we what. We need to hook them in. And so it was a really a great creative discussion about, yeah, you've already done the recordings with him. You're having real-time conversations with him. Also gave me him. more time to have more recordings with him. Yeah. Because I knew that once I started putting it out, he was going to change his tune about That's right. everything because he's going to be able to hear himself. Yeah, and, and looking in hindsight, it was brilliant, right? Holding off. I always say, like, don't hold on to things. Actually put them there forward because in sure. every episode, you've got something great to share that's going to be big. So mm -hmm. put it forward first. 
But in this case, I actually think it was the right call. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was it. Just went against my natural instinct, and and actually your right instinct, I think. But also, I think it forces you to look at all the other stuff. And we we hooked you with the story in other elements. Yeah. And it made like, if you like that exercise made us do that, yeah. knowing that we have something even bigger coming. But what what can we do with this? And like so, those first three episodes were really cool because it it just took you through like the the whole story at at, at large. Why would you even care about Wayne Williams be, talking to a podcaster if you didn't know who he was and what he may have? Done? That's right. So no matter what the this could be the most the the biggest thing in the world that's ever been covered. It could be the Oklahoma City bombing. It could be nine eleven. It could be the Olympic bombing. Whatever that is. Yeah. You have to assume that no one knows anything. You actually yeah. have to start from scratch and you need to start telling that story as if no one knows it. Not to insult their intelligence, no. but to lay the framework for what you're going to bring later on. And yeah. it's so important yeah. to establish that. And I think some people get that wrong. And there, you have so much. You have people that can actually tell the story for you. Yep. Archives that can tell the story for you. And and people that were there at the time. All those things yeah. help you tell that story to either the people that already know it and you give them a little kernel of something that they didn't know and they're hooked. Or like we talked about before, those young people who know nothing about it and you're setting the framework. Shit got off the rails around five or six yeah. because I had built all the way up to this arc in my head with Wayne and then Wayne Williams just fucked everything up. <laughs> Then I found myself less as a podcaster, and I was just talking. I was just appeasing Wayne Williams for hours on end, trying to find a moment or a gap in between his talking to try to get him to answer any real questions. And then I was like, this isn't going to work the way I thought it was going to work. And so then I had to spend days while not like still responding to him. And going back through the tape, I was like, I know he's lied to me. Where did he lie to me? Yeah. And I went through and I found them specifically. And I had to go double, triple, quadruple check with the facts of the case and all the court records and everything and how I asked that. And I'm like, okay, now that I know he lied here, 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 how do I present it to him and how do I keep him on topic? And so I was gearing up for that for the last several episodes. And that shit was happening really as the podcast was coming out. We, we really said was. at the time, the, 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 one, I don't recommend this. I don't. Two, this will never happen again. And that's a lie because it's, it's a complete happening lie. right now. Yeah, it's happening. I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it right now too. Yeah. And e there's something to that, though, right? <laughs> yeah. a and, you know... It, it's going to kill Donald to hear this, but <laughs> like, and also like, we're, we're both correct here, right? If, if you're making content, you're making a show in general, then you need to have it all together and buttoned up before you deliver it in, in some way to an audience with certain types of true crime shows, podcasts, especially, I think that there is a level of fluidity that you don't have to stick to and lean into, but if you're not, I think you're not doing the case a good service here. I think that you're you're uh, minimizing your opportunity to move the needle. Do you think we've gotten away from from that though? I f I feel like oh that's that to me is far gone. I feel like the factories have been built. Oh yeah, the content's being cranked out, and and this is what I. That's kind of what I miss a little bit is that is the chaos is the is the surprise it's the the revelation like I just feel like we need more people out there doing this taking chances knocking on doors throwing stuff in the trash reinventing it last minute like it's kind of the swashbuckling of podcasts that I that I kind of miss yeah and I think even further than that um, whatever you think of what's gone on in the industry the last let's just say year. You know, narratives, limited series, I believe are, well, no matter what form these are taking, whether it's talk like this or it's mm -hmm. video or whatever, I still believe that limited series are the heart and soul of 
the industry. Mm -hmm. Just it's kind of like HBO can't exist without their tentpole programs, mm -hmm. without True Detective, without right. Game of Thrones, yeah, yeah. without White Lotus. That's what everyone loves. That's right. the appointment viewing. So we're a little bit swinging the other way because of nervousness around economics and scale and all that stuff. And and some teams just not existing anymore, getting gutted, t playing it safe, yep. cranking up the factory, if you will. And I just, I believe that this is cyclical. I think that this will come back. I think we haven't really talked about that many shows being made into TV TV series or movies as mm -hmm. much as we did. Yeah. I think that's already coming back in a in a big way. I've got a lot to talk about there. Yeah. yeah. And I just think it just takes that energy. There's a real energy in making these limited series and a real energy with the audience that you just don't get anywhere else. And I'm just fiercely, fiercely gung ho of just trying to make the best shit that I can. Why, as, why as, are you as, like that? Uh, I'm like that because... Why haven't you just settled and been like, damn, this is good enough? Um, I think maybe you and... Not that many people will understand this, but um, I want to make the stuff that I want to make. And um, I feel like I'm never finished. And I'm exhausted by franch franchises, superheroes, reboots, recuts, prequels, sequels, um, recasting... I just, when fresh content hit, hits me, I just, I just, it's great, right? Mm -hmm. It's so refreshing. And so you clearly like the documentary. Oh, I story love it. Right? I do. So you love the storytelling, but why do you like true crime storytelling? Because that's a, that's a specific thing and it comes with a lot. Yeah. It's one of my lanes. I, I would. Yeah, of uh, course. It's one of my lanes too. But I would say my lane is drama. Okay. So is that how you look at it? I look at it as I'm the drama guy. And there's hints of drama. There's hints of true crime in drama. Mm. So, like, is The Sopranos true crime? Right. Like, there's I intersections, guess. right? There's yeah. nuances in this in this space. Yeah. Um. I will tell you though, after Zodiac Killer, when we mm. did that, yeah, I was done with serial killers. That was like my rule. I was like, I just can't yeah. deal with that version of true crime. Yeah. You have to separate yourself from from that stuff. At a certain point, or or you get to a point where you learn that you gotta compartmentalizing it and and shielding yourself or taking a break from it is what you need to do to tell the story properly and to stay in your own lane and not fuck this up. Yeah, like it, and it happens every single time for me. Yeah, mostly, you know, not I'm not really ever looking at awful photos of stuff and we've, we've seen it yeah. but it's usually <clears throat> i'm in the thick of it dealing with persons of interest and family and this interconnected thing that is there's no definitive right or wrong and i'm on the pulse of it and i don't want to back down but there's no clear path forward either yeah and that's uh you got to be able to check yourself and step back and look at it differently constantly or else you're going to be fall victim of it yourself of your of your own storytelling of your own obsession with it yeah i, I mean i think if we if you let's actually to answer your question let's yeah. take um let's take true detective mm -hmm. as as an example let's think of season 1 with yeah. mcconaughey and, yeah. and woody harrelson and then the most recent season with jody foster mm -hmm. There is a kind of an inherent desire to find out what happens. Yeah. It's just there's it's it's a mystery. Yeah. True crime is a mystery that you as the audience are trying to piece together and solve. Mm -hmm. I think as a creator, as yeah. a producer, as someone out in the field, you're kind of not only experiencing that, but you're actually living that. There's actually yeah. something in your gut that drives you to want to figure stuff out. You're also and, solving the mystery of the storytelling. Yeah, it's exactly. Right. How, even if I know more than the audience, what should I tell them and when should I tell them that stuff? Right. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it, it's, it's wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you like true crime because of the mystery, really. And I think that's a, that is an age old genre. It's timeless things that you don't understand or, or 
that bothers people. That scratches that curiosity bone in your body, right? And that's why I'm so drawn to true crime. I hate even the term true crime. Yeah. Um, I, I like the mystery of it. I I have a lot of thoughts about true crime, but I had this whole opening monologue that I had written and I, I recorded it. I played it back for myself and I was like, no, I can't, I can't put this out there. This is ridiculous. But I ended up slimming it down from like 10 minutes to like three minutes. And you actually hear it at the end of episode one of the new season. Um, but how I feel about it is that when I first made Up and Vanished, there wasn't a blueprint really for the non-journalist, non-credentialed person to be making a investigative show on an unsolved case and be that in depth with it. And then that got really big. And I got a lot of shit for being that guy who shouldn't be that guy. And that's okay. That was, that's fine. And like, I ate that, dealt with that, learned from that, matured from that. Then you fast forward, you know, seven years later, season four, right? Everyone does that. It is totally normal now for Joe Schmo to go make, go investigate a cold case and make a podcast about it. And I, I kind of just realized that on my own in, in like a organic way. And it made me think, okay, so I have two options here in making a new season of this show. I can do what I, I know how to do and stick to that and just tell a good story. But what if I take all that I've learned from all my mistakes, all the things that worked as much as I've been hardened over the years and went even harder and took bigger risks that I wouldn't have taken or couldn't have taken back then. Feel again how I felt in 2016, scared alone on an island. If I do that, then I'll have no regrets. Yeah, it's actually something I wanted to comment about this season mm -hmm. that you really, you address something that's kind of been it stuck with me for years and I've, I've let what, it... What was it? Which part? Uh, fear. Mm, yeah. So the first, whatever, I, I told you this, um, first nine or 10 minutes of the first episode of this season is an absolute masterpiece. Okay. Th well, one, thank you. But two, tell me why, because I I, val I value your opinion here. So it's like it, it, I get chills. Like there's a real, I feel like you're in harm's way. I feel like you're going into harm's way in a big way and it scares the shit out of me. And by the way, um, and this is throughout the episodes, mm -hmm. we're actually slowly flying to the destination that maybe you like you're- like that part? Yeah. I love it. That was a I conscious effort that I had to really kind of tweak. It was little things. Yes. But I was like, it feels nice slowly getting here and it's slow to get there in real life. Yeah. And I kind of- took an hour to get there it's like the turbulence on uh -huh. the plane and like that is a metaphor for your own kind of turbulence in your brain you know uh -huh. yeah and i think uh, I, i'm t you know there's been many conversations that i would sit on for two days before making a phone call to an fbi agent totally or having an uncomfortable Which is conversation if, you, if you're thinking that then you should do that yeah yeah but i i, I was literally just fearful of the word no like not even fearful for my life, I was fearful of someone saying no to me. Yeah, and it took me a long time to get over that. And and some of that's repetition, some of that's confidence, some of that's, you know, like just right. saying, stop it already, go out there and knock on someone's door, mm -hmm. right? Like it's actually okay. Or uh, seeing the people you work with do these things, and not wanting to be the one that screws up. Yeah. Um. And so to me, what I'm hearing and seeing in this new season is this underlying fear and this the kind of unknown danger mm -hmm. and the audience feels it. I'm telling you, they feel it. And so yeah. it has that edge to it. It has, I know you and I know like how you will do some pretty wild things already. I and can promise you it goes there. And, and that this is the hard part about tr trying to figure out how to express that in a podcast yeah. is that I automatically know that there's going to be a percentage of people who think I'm just drumming some shit up. 
And in a way, I'm being poetic about it, so I am. But and what? How can I express to you my genuine fear? But the, see, the audience is. So what we don't sometimes realize is the audience is actually rooting for you mm -hmm. as a storyteller and as a character in your own right. series. Yeah, yeah. They're rooting for you, and they want. They actually want to hear all the emotions. Like, yeah, I've worked with journalists who, and I've, I'm guilty of this too. You're there, and you can't help but break down and cry when mm -hmm. some when you're interviewing someone, right? Because it's just human. Yeah. Um, I think people want to hear that that you are just as human as the person you're talking to. Yeah. And and it's just, you know, I think during the pandemic we had that couple year stretch where we were do, kind of doing everything on the phone and zooms. Yeah, I hated that. And I said, when I start Waveland and I start this new thing, the last resort is you can make a phone call. There, That's easy. That's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's your second. You or start th here and you yeah. land there if you got to. <laughs> Unless we run out of budget on something. <laughs> yeah, shit happens. You right? must do it in person. That mm -hmm. is my rule. And I took some really experienced journalists on the road. Yeah. And what I didn't realize to 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 do exactly that. And they were like, "Wait, we're we're going to all these places." I was like, "Right, because that's, oh, yeah. that's I, not e not one not easy to do. Not always what happens, anyways." And and I think a lot of what we see in print and digital is quick emails. Oh yeah, phone calls that are twenty minutes. One of these questions for or, the for the quote. Yep. And what happened? It was so it, I was so proud of this. Is we would have these conversations with some pretty big big deal people. Yeah. And you know, my creators that I'll be working with, they said. Wow, you're right. Um, you know, we were we were with someone for six hours, right? And then we came back for breakfast the next morning for another three. Yeah. Now we may only use you know thirty three, minutes in a three minutes, of, yeah. right? But like, you earn trust. Yeah. You hear the sights and sounds of where you're going, mm -hmm. and then you just build a rapport with people. And you know, one of my other rules and kind of because I've done tons of interviews. Is and what's so great about audio is you put the mic on, and after about fifteen minutes, um, it melts away. And unlike being filmed, mm -hmm. there is a comfort level where you forget that that's that it's there. And so I I ha have learned that people, although they may be hesitant, they may seem resistant. They actually want to tell you their truth, mm -hmm. and the problem is no one ever asked them. The th uh, thing is, do you want to listen? Yeah. Do you want, like, do you genuinely want to listen? Do you want to listen? And do you want to ask them a question that no one's ever asked them? Right. And so I over. Are you willing to tell them things that you're asking them about too? Exactly. So, um, I obsessively prepare. Yeah. I come up with my list of questions. I, I reorder them. And then I throw them in the trash and I memorize them. And then it's just a fluid conversation. And you ask that question. And there's that moment. I see it. I, I spent 18 months with former KGB agent Jack Barsky. Wow. And I, I sat with him for three or four hours at a time at his house during the pandemic in one little tiny room like this. Yeah. And I asked him questions. Maybe I would be fearful of some of these questions because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting in there. Yeah. And you could just see the relief like the the burden come off of him yeah he's ready to it's talk cathartic probably it's cathartic no one's ever asked me this mm -hmm. because we're all kind of narcissistic we only care about ourselves we're so busy with our own lives mm -hmm. the stuff we talk about with each other is fairly superficial mm -hmm. but when you ask a deep question yeah it's it's meaningful and he came back and he said you know i've told you things that not even my wife knows i'm like really now i gotta kill you <laughs> yeah, now I got to kill you. And I just, over and over again, you've got to have, again, going back to fear. Yeah. You're going to have some tough conversations. You're going to have some amazing conversations. Mm -hmm. You just got to, you got to have some stones to be able to just be brave and ask yeah. the question. And you might actually be surprised by the answers you get. Wasn't it funny that almost every single time that you were super anxious and fearful of an interview, Nine times out of ten, it was just your own anxiety in the way. You actually taught me something that I repeat over and over. I don't know if you realize this or not. Okay. Um, the art of the awkward silence. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, what's, that yeah. what's that mean to you? Um, 
it, it, what's funny about it is that I never intentionally did that. I learned that on accident. There were times where I was interviewing somebody and I was obviously very concerned about how this was being perceived by them and that we felt comfortable and I wasn't coming across as weird or too much or overbearing or invasive. And I would just be in the moment so much and I would blank and I would sit there. I've done that too. And then what's my next question? And I'm dying inside. It's five seconds of silence. And they go, but also, and I'm like, oh my God, it's like that, that moment of silence. They felt it too. They felt it worse than I did. Right. And it, it makes you kind of rethink it. If you were to do it to me, it would work on me too. It's like, because you want people to understand what you're saying. And I realized that, hey, if you just sit back and listen, then you're going to, you can let things happen. Then your job becomes not, it, it becomes steering it, right? Keeping them on that thought, which is hard to do on anything you're thinking about. If it's some traumatic thing or some complicated sad story, then it's hard to go back and pick at those things. And so your job as an interviewer there, I feel like, is to make them feel as comfortable as possible and let them take the stage so they feel like empowered by it and then give them that guidance and that like you would want if you got off topic or yeah, exactly. You're right. And like, just keep it going. So you, you can can't, get it out. Yeah. You can't right? show up and like, I get, I got to get these three things. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You never get those things that you were looking for like that. If that, if that's, if you wanted boom, 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 you're going to get something, but it's never going to be what you wanted it to be. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, you, you almost, so again, going back to Jack Barsky and talking Mm -hmm. to him, those interviews would be three and four hours at a time, like I was mentioning. And at the end, he's like, Oh my God, I'm exhausted. Yeah, and me too. <laughs> and I'm exhausted too. And you work yourself to the point of exhaustion because you want yeah. to hear everything about their lives. And you you may have gotten those couple things, but you've opened up another 10 things along the way that you never expected. Mm-hmm. And so you have to plan for that version of chaos. Yeah, you, yeah, you got to allow for that to exist. You're coming into this story, looking at it from all the information you have right now. Yeah, And you can build that in your head as many times as you want. But when you start gathering that information and talking to the real people in this story, in this case, yeah. it changes. It becomes what it really is. And there are a million different facets of it that you never could have anticipated that is now up to you to uh, include or mold into what your vision of what you thought this thing was. And that's, it becomes a living, breathing thing in that way. But you have to allow that to happen. Yeah. You go in their tunnel vision you're going to come, you're going to stay in the tunnel forever and it's going to be the same old thing everyone else does. And if you only had those three questions that you were trying to get, you're going to have a real awkward silence when you don't know where to go next. Yeah. And you're like, "Okay, thank you." It's like you just left a bunch of stuff on the table. It's funny for as much as I I prep sometimes for an interview, I always abort the questions. Yeah. I always just I'm like, ah, it's like um it's like if I go on stage ever, I'm like at a certain point, I I have to just do it. I can't be trying to recite what I memorize. It's almost like I have to improvise it to a degree, feel the pressure of it, and like and harness that, use that to do what I couldn't think of before. And when I was trying to write those questions down, it's your your like to me, your preparation is your obsession. Mm-hmm. So you don't just like before I do anything or your own self-confidence that you you do have things back there in your brain. Yeah, I mean you I'm, know something. I'm thinking of questions like all the time. Yeah. And I'm like what about this? What about that? Exactly. On and on. So you've you've done your internal preparation. I do it on my morning runs. It's my office hours, right? I'm thinking about these things creatively whatever. Mm-hmm. And so you just you don't let it go. It's not just seeing a piece of paper and like, "Oh, okay, here we go. Here's the five questions." Mm-hmm. Let me ask you. Um, why do you think people talk to you to me yeah specifically yeah (sighs) that's a good question um maybe there's a something about me that is 
I, 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 the only way I can answer that as objectively as I possibly could is try to imagine myself <laughs> interviewing me. I think I'd, I'd have the first thought of, what's up with this guy, right? I, I'd be like, not, ne- not necessarily a negative connotation there, but maybe sometimes. But like, what's up with this guy? And so like, kind of, I think for a lot of people, that might be a thing for a moment. And then they might be surprised by how down to earth I'm being about this or how much I'm trying to relate to you on a human level with my own life experiences. And then that becomes this shift where you're like, oh, wow, maybe I, maybe I can trust you. And I just try to live up to that. I, I, and also, I think it's just as simple as not being afraid to ask questions. There really isn't a question that I wouldn't ask somebody yeah. unless it was just completely offensive. Right. <laughs> in which I would never ask something like that or I'd try not to, right? But I, I'm not ever too afraid to ask, how do you feel about that? And I'm asking because I actually am thinking that. I'm curious. And if I'm asking you, like, how do you feel about that? Obviously, I'm signing myself up for you to say, well, how do you feel about that, right? So, and I know that subconsciously, so I'm prepared to do that. So what about the people that have something to hide? Why do, th- why do they talk to you? Like, how do I s- say this without sounding <laughs> ridiculous here? I think I would be afraid of myself <laughs> if I was being asked questions and I had a secret. Because I would feel like that person's not going to give it up I don't know what links they would go to to get this information and I gotta be on my toes and I know if I don't participate at a certain point or whatever that I'm gonna send red flags up to him and make my situation a whole lot worse and so I I am consciously thinking about that in a lot of a lot of scenarios and like, I feel like there's no one, if someone's saying no, they don't want to talk to me, it better be a good damn reason. Because I'm not gonna, trying to talk to people who I don't genuinely in my heart feel like have something to say. I'm not trying to like just dig up random sound bites for my story. I, at my core, believe you're a big part of this in whatever way that is, good or bad. And there shouldn't be a reason for you to say no unless you're just uncomfortable and I'm willing to talk to you about that. Yeah, I'm willing to hear you out and maybe we decide that we don't do this, but you at least can tell me that and that's okay and we can shake hands and we're, we're good. If you don't do that and you cannot connect to me on that level when I really try and put myself out there in some vulnerable way, a lot of times... The only people who are doing that are the people who have secrets. Right. And that sticks out like a sore thumb. <laughs> and I mean, this season, I had made a conscious decision to approach this suspect differently than I have anybody else in my entire career because I weighed the outcomes and I decided to myself that if I go this way, I think I know what the result's going to be. Is that why we came this far? Is that why we make these shows? Is that why the family wanted me to make a story on this? It's just to go point somebody out? Right. Or do I take it a step further within the, the legal, within my legal bounds to do something out of the box and scary with the sole purpose of trying to find out the truth and that was that was the fucking scariest thing i've done this whole time because it was kind of like a moral dilemma for a minute that i ultimately sorted in not that long because i it just made me look in the mirror as what do you value what why are you doing this and it's the it goes back to why I did it in the first place. I'm not just doing it to tell a story. I'm If I'm investigating something, I'm really trying to investigate it. And I'll be honest, I'm pissed 
that season two and season three cases aren't solved. Hmm. That fucking pisses me off, man. Now, I've never stopped investigating them. I have had, I've flown to Denver three or four times now in the past year, and I've shared with them a lot of information, and there is active investigations going on in these cases. But I look at that and sit and think, what could I have done differently, right? And the only thing I can control is putting myself out of my comfort zone a little bit more and just believing that it's going to be okay. Even if that is in a, a certain moment, not necessarily the case. We can feel the fear. I mean, the, the, the audience fear, not that you're afraid, but we, yeah. we're afraid for you. Right. This confrontation is a big, I mean, you've shared some of the stuff that the rest of the universe is going to hear pretty soon. Mm -hmm. It's chilling. Yeah. And it's not only chilling as a confrontation in and of itself, but again, in the back of your brain, again, we're rooting for you. We're scared for you. And we don't know what the outcome is. We don't mm -hmm. because and 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 in that moment I don't either. Yeah, and you're trying to weigh those things. Like, what are the options? I always think out or try to think out every possibility. What could? What are the options here? Yeah, and I'm like, okay, going this way is my is my best option. I I I could yield the most results this way, and if I'm going to go this way, I'm not going to half-ass this way. I'm not going to one foot in, one foot out. And so I really, truly embodied a character and created an entire trap for this individual. And, you know, I hope this becomes a conversation. Do you think you did the right thing? Yeah. I want to hear the argument to why I didn't. I think that if you're willing to say that, not on some Instagram comment, not in some review or some phantom Reddit account, if you really think that I didn't do the right thing and want to have a conversation about that, I'm, I'm curious as to why you think that. And the only thing I can think of is that you are upset that I tricked this person. Law enforcement does that all the time. Law enforcement isn't involved in this case. We are. I am. I'm not breaking the law. Well, it's not like you didn't have a... So what I also love is you actually put some of that debate yes. of what you should do, what's going on in your mind. It, yes. it wasn't just like, let's play games, let's play tricks, let's do whatever. Like you actually had the moral discussion about what we should what what's the what should we be doing? How should we be doing it? Is everyone going to be safe? Like what's the right... Like that... That was a discussion that you you kind of included in mm -hmm. the in the in the podcast, if you will. Because if you ask me if I think I did the right thing, to me it goes immediately to the conversation of okay, well if we're gonna do that, let's zoom out even further, right? Let's look at all the other true crime podcasts. Are they doing the right thing? Is just covering it on its surface enough? Either is it good enough? It, so it, it's like, you know, or is my attempt in generating something new worth it? Or, or what's the point of any of this stuff if it's just purely for your entertainment? I think what people, another kind of even more extension that you just said about season two and season three of Up and Vanished and that not being solved and how that eats at you and mm -hmm. how, the, how that's still important and you're invested yeah. is people don't. I don't, th I don't think they realize the connections that we actually make with people yeah. during these series. So I've got the the father of um, Skylar Niece. His mm -hmm. name is Dave Niece, the sweetest guy in the world. Right. His daughter was murdered. It's in our new podcast, Three. Yep, which is out now. Yep, yep. it's out now. We've got the first, th it's three three teenage girls going to the woods and yeah. only two come out. And wow. it's this kind of gothic tale of yeah, the, the, tr the triangle of three teenagers and girls and what that means. Um, but Dave calls me. Yeah. And he texts me. And yeah. I get, I have these, these long standing relationships yep. with the people. And, and you do like, and, and that's, there's only so many people I know my peers and there's, a, there's a lot of them yeah. 
who are this deep with it, where they have relationships where you're getting a text from these people. You didn't just go there one time and then never saw you again. Yeah. That happens a lot. It does. It's different when you're not doing that. And it's a re- you feel a responsibility, don't you? Going out to Hawaii and, you know, a wrongfully convicted man that was in prison for over 20 years, he's out and that feels wonderful, but I'm getting, you know, text at four in the morning, his time, 10 a.m. my time. He's like, I can't sleep. I've got everything wrong with me because I'm still so shaken by this world yeah. and I'm his counsel, right? I'm, I'm the first person or, or just a, one of a handful of people They've actually listened to this man for the first time in many, many years, and I'm advocating on his behalf. And so that pattern repeats itself over and over again. And so sometimes you get the that, you get, you know, again, a father who's lost his daughter. There's nothing worse than that. Nothing worse than that. And then you get, you know, then you get Wayne Williams calling from, uh, from prison. And by the way, I don't know if the audience knows this, yeah, but you had to block him. I blocked. You used to show me on your phone how many times he called you like overnight or, you know, it would be like 38 times in a row trying to reach it. You had to block Wayne Williams. I had to block Wayne Williams from prison on multiple numbers, multiple cell phones, landlines. Once I had trapped him, like once I had caught him in a lie, everything shifted and he went off trying to take me back the other way and i was so exhausted of hearing his nonsense man and when people ask me do you think he did it hell yeah he did it i feel the same way did he do all of them no that's part of what's wrong here but that guy is a child murderer we went you remember after the show wrapped we went into that it's like the Atlanta Police Department's archives. Yeah, all it was the, so surreal, man. It was so surreal, like table after table, yeah. box after box. It was probably what, like 40, 50 boxes. It was insane. We found Wayne Williams' original license. Just like seeing this stuff was like... Photo lineups. It yeah. was, unfortunately, all the photos from the yeah. scenes that we had visited. Yep. You know, behind the gas station and where the old school used to be and kind of all those spots... It was heartbreaking, and I had it actually hit different for me when I saw we had been talking about this. None of the kind of TV archival footage that we had pulled had ever, of course, showed a a, a dead child. Mm-hmm. But then we saw it in person. Yeah, that was insane. in an envelope, and it just was like, whoa, this is really bad and really gruesome. And we have to remember how gruesome it was. That murder is not a an act of kindness at all. It is a seeing horrible, that, horrible thing. Seeing the thing. bodies from what's his name the the guy who found the hairs we we drove to his house right and he showed us the bodies and showed us the hairs on the bodies at the scene and that is that was absolutely horrific larry peterson larry peterson yeah throwback yeah um in that police department this place they also had a back room Mm -hmm. of other evidence and i remember them opening the door and there's like lots of bicycles and kind of bigger things that they had they have to keep they have to store it's different than big evidence items right yeah Yeah. bigger than paper like because paper you can file in boxes licenses objects i remember um in sorry in the in the boxes was they had some kkk newspapers yeah they were still on that theme and that kind of proved that they were looking at that but I remember in the box were these two big, they look like film reels. Mm-hmm. And it still eats at me to this day. Um, when Wayne's trial was happening, the media, so it wasn't recorded on video, all the news reporters were in another room on closed circuit television. Mm-hmm. So they could watch without being in the room because it was packed. Yeah. But the legendary kind of Wayne getting angry and saying, you know, kind of throwing a temper. Yeah. You wouldn't know it unless you were sitting in there. Yeah. I believe that that, 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 that trial was actually taped and then those were the tapes. And so how, this big real how label. How get them? It's still there. And I actually asked if we could take them out and they said, unless you can get one of those players here and we agree to do it, we can't let you what do players? it. What players? 
like you know the old school like player of audio like a, a big tape machine that oh, no we one can have. find that we, we need to get it there we'd have to get it we there. could do that yeah it would be an entire mission right and then and then transferring it and to it's digital gonna be and all that when we do it <laughs> but like that's that's yeah. That's audio, right? Like yeah. no one ever thought of this being used from 82, 83, whatever. But it also the fact that it's still there is kind of like still there. And it's kind of the linchpin if you're if you're talking about if you're puzzled by Wayne Williams' character and if he's capable, if you've fallen for his con here, his like psychopathic ways, right? Yeah. And his narcissistic tricks, then witnessing that would give you a glimpse potentially into the monster within. And I think that's what it did for a lot of people. And to hear that, I think would be for a lot of people, some sort of closure or understanding that, yeah, for as much, uh, for as many weird things as there are here, this guy still did this. Well, and to shift the conversation a little bit, it also brings up, something that I know you and I get frustrated with Sean Kipe who I've done multiple shows with yeah yeah like um you know uh our previous mayor you know s- there was a look at the DNA around around Wayne Williams and and the child murders it's been what like 4 or 5 years now so the GBI which is kind of the local FBI Georgia Bureau of Investigation I haven't heard of them. Yeah, right. Like they won't tell you anything. Um, they're working on it. They have even you know they got it right. They'll solve it. Well, it's just we don't know what's going on, and so we're able to poke around the corners to get to things that the public wants to find out about. Where is that line? Like, I our our need to know the truth. How is that weighed against, in your opinion, weighed against the um, desire need to keep things? private in a in an open investigation if you will because it's really frustrating when people can yeah can up and they and they won't talk and and we've got Payne and jason and all these sean and all these people rooting around for the truth and we think we're pretty good at it and we're really good sleuths how do we deal with that because yeah some some within like the GBI are like, yeah, all right, okay, this is great. And the other half is like, do not step in my t- territory. This is ours. You need to stay away. Mm-hmm. We hear it, you know, we hear it over and over all again. All the time. I, I feel like if enough time has gone by, if uh, right. enough time has transpired and this case isn't solved, then for whatever reason, that is the case. It doesn't matter why that is. For whatever reason, it's the case you are now subject to an investigation of your investigation. I would subject my, myself to that same philosophy. Or what's the point of journalism in the first place? You were saying that you're looking for big stories to tell and, and you had this whole sort of uh, evaluation of big audience, small audience, big story, small story. I feel like what happens a lot of times in the creative business, because there's a business part of this and there are systems with a business and there are structures. And I feel like sometimes what I like to do is maybe this story to me is a big story. That's why I'm interested in it. Right. But maybe, maybe I know that it may not feel like that to everyone else. How do I create a big audience for this story? How do I get a big audience interested in what I know they may not be unless I did it the right way or something? The biggest hurdle in the creative process, if you're in the creative business, is that it's human instinct to repeat what you just did. And I've had a unique experience with this because it's been almost every time I've made a podcast, I've been told I can't do that. Radio Rental, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how you do an anthology show. Why is it called that? And I'm like, that's the point. I want it because because it made you say, what is this? <laughs> I could have been wrong. It could have not worked. High like, strange. High strange. Why are you doing UFOs now? 
What are you, a conspiracy theorist? No, no, that's the point. Well, you can't be curious? What? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, what, uh, wait, everyone else is talking about it, but you can't? Is like, what you're thinking? And don't think that I didn't forget that I was told that I shouldn't and couldn't make a true crime podcast to begin with. Right. I never forgot that. <laughs> I remembered that. I still remember that. And I think it's important for me to remember that as a creator because it tells me that it's okay to go against the grain. It's, but it's, it's going to be uncomfortable, but everyone's going to catch up once it starts working and they'll never remember <laughs> that because it every time it feels like a new foreign thing. You want to do what you, okay, I, I broke the mold on this and it's some new thing and that worked. Now we're just doing that now. No, we're not. We're doing the <laughs> next thing. Yeah. And like it's that is exhausting to try to systemize, but I think it's what you have to hold on to to a degree as a creative person engineering this thing. That's that's how the most special content has ever been made. It's because it was the outlier. It did something different. And that meant that there, that the creator was out on a limb. They felt like this shit couldn't. There's no blueprint for this shit working. Everyone wants the 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 whole runway for the thing, right? But that's not going to make st stuff that lasts for a hundred years. I don't think. Yeah. What do you mean, two thousand one, a space odyssey? What do you mean, a sh the shining? Right. right. Well, that sounds weird. Sounds awesome though. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. awesome. But like, who's gonna go see that? Mm -hmm. You know, Star Everybody. Star Wars, George Lucas. Like, what is this? A space opera? What the hell is yeah, that? You forget that at, at one point in time, some of the greatest works in history were some foreign idea that people probably shot down because there was no proof that this would work. People want proof that it would work. And, and the creative industry that usually is some other comparison to another body of work that succeeded and you're modeling it after how they did it because you know that people like that. Why I would rather spend my, I'd rather spend time in my brain trying to figure out how I can get more people to like something that they may not innately like. Maybe I didn't innately like it either. And now I do. And that way that I got into it is going to be the foundation for how I want to get you into this too. And I'm really kind of communicating with you yeah. like, hey, let me show you a door here. Yeah. Hear me out. 30, 30 seconds, right? Got you in the th first, 30, th of first 30 of the podcast. Can I level with you? Can I get you in there the same way I, I was? I was dubious too. And I'll get and like, I'll give it to you. Yeah. But come here for a second. I got to show you something. Yeah. Right. And I think that you can't lose sight of that. And it's easy to do that because you don't want to fail. <laughs> and it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and it's weird. And yeah, it's, and it is it's weird. hard to even explain. Uh, it is. I call, I kind of have tried to put this in a box sometimes and explain how we but you feel. You see me do this shit too. Oh, and I've you've see seen, I've also seen you, which is also like why I think we have a great relationship is i've seen you question what i've been doing and and been like all right like i i, I don't know and then I, it will actualize and you'll go oh i get it now yeah and then you you do that now too and i'm like oh wow for me that's validating too because i'm like oh like we're all growing here well, remember what we're I all learning from each other. I'm learning from you too, right? Remember what I said? I'm working on eight series at the same time. Which is, I mean, the sound like he's being for real, guys. This but, is, but yeah, there's like there's eight creative processes, <laughs> right? And yeah. different hosts Unique. and journalists. So some are documentary filmmakers, mm -hmm. some are journalists, some are writers. Many have never done this before. Yep. Um, some of these are very personal biographic stories. Wait, let me guess. Do they say? But I'm not a podcaster, right? Like they all have this. So. The biggest mistake I could make is say this is how this is how you make a podcast. Mm -hmm. So I am like I am how I describe it to everyone is I'm very involved. I can be very micro in the process of assisting on many levels. As you know me as not the 
the corporate suit, but I'm the I'm the I can edit audio. I can do the interview. You can get down to the to the minutia. I can do every yeah. part of this except host. No, you can uh, do that too. No, I can't. I'm terrible. We can't be good at all things. <laughs> no, I will you, you never can't. host another series again. You will. I will not do that. Anyway, <laughs> I part of this is um, understanding that they know I'm there for them, that I'm going to be very involved, but that I'm going to give them the oxygen and the space to do it their way. Is that what you crave too? I love it. I right? love it. Are I, you Are you giving to them what you desire to yes absolutely i or want what you've desired it for a long time that you like you you were i don't want eight of the same thing i want yeah exactly. eight different things that delight me yeah and therefore the audience and i want them to be delighted in the experience and for me to be able to wrap my arms around them and say i got you and anything you don't know we will do it together that's and, awesome yeah. and at the end of the day I will be there just just like any of the families that I've interviewed and mm -hmm. some of those hardships. I get calls all the time from people in tears that don't know where to go. They don't know how to do it. Um, all the way to, I've got this. Thanks for being there. This is professional. It's structured. It's whatever. But I just really want to respect the process of letting people do their thing. And then again, wrapping my arms around them. I will get in a story and edit the shit out of it and be hardcore in trying to get to the thing, but I will also back off at the same time. And that's just, it's just respect at the end of the day. Yeah. It's being invested. Being conscious of that too. Yes. So with you, I mean, it was, you know, listen, uh, we don't also, know. I felt it, that it was my responsibility to deliver. Yeah. And I took that seriously though. Yeah. Had I not, then I would have, it would have been appro totally appropriate for you to not get down with that anymore well and or we're learning and building through okay this is uh not how i'd like to do it but maybe we're learning how to do something through this process actually yeah right and we all love this we all love to be popular we all love the spotlight on us we all love that stuff uh -huh. um but i so how i look at that is i'm okay being behind the scenes mm -hmm. and being boosting other people up but also kind of doing whatever I need to do to make something big and awesome. Yeah, yeah. But I also really want my shit to be popular. I want a lot of people to listen to this. So yeah. otherwise, why are we there? It's a it's a it's a science project. It's an art project. Like it yeah, doesn't make exactly. sense. This is some fucking fair project or some shit. Like, what are we doing? Or like actually it's funny. I saw a, like a TikTok of Ben Affleck recently. Uh -huh. And he was talking about I'm gonna butcher how he said <laughs> it, but he was talking about fame and you know like a big audience and something on the, something like that and he was basically saying it's not that he craves the attention he's performing he's creating something and he wants the most amount of people to experience this yeah. and it's like i get that someone may not understand that as a creator, I think a lot of us do, and that's how I'm wired. Yeah, you're not a sellout for doing that either. I mean, when no, we, when, no. When we, it's like I want this thing to be as big as possible because it's, I think it's important, and this is my craft, and so doing that on the grandest scale involves that at the end of the day, in some way, shape, or form. And I walked in here today, and you said to me, "I keep refreshing because Up and Vanish is number two. You should mm -hmm. probably do a check right now, by the way. I did when you were in the bathroom. <laughs> it's still number two. <laughs> and uh, I'll do it again. <laughs> and three is at number 18. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I think we talked about this, right? We obsess about this stuff. We want our stuff to be seen. We, If something's climbing the charts, yeah. it means something's happening. Someone is discovering something and it's being discussed with friends that we, yeah. we will never know what those conversations were. We will never know exactly how this thing got to be popular in all the you know hundreds of thousands of machinations but we think it's pretty cool and if you know that an audience is really getting behind something it's just the best feeling in the world so i don't need to be the host of everything i don't don't need to have my name and lights all the time right but I you don't do have want to stay in this sort of yeah spotlight per se yeah like to, to stay energized by it right yeah. yeah and you know i did um when i was at imperative or the second podcast i did was called boom time with texas monthly great podcast thank you yes. and in 2019 we released it at the end of the year and it really was incredible um it was really good 
Uh, thanks. And and it it was a long journey. I bet. But it is it the TV show now called Landman is started shooting two weeks ago. Oh, amazing, dude! Because that's been a long. I remember you telling me about that, telling me about that a long time ago. Long that's time. Cool. And um, Taylor Sheridan for Paramount Plus. Billy Bob Thornton. That's so good, man. As the lead. It's so perfect. It's such a... What does that feel like to have this sort of like reimagining of this this world that you brought forth it's, first to, to like push it to an even bigger stage? It's like John Hamm and Demi Moore just got added to the cast. It's like, what's just happening? I just right, saw like, him on the last on? season of Fargo. What's going on? Yeah, exactly. Evil yeah, John amazing. Hamm, the cowboy, is now in this series. Mm-hmm. And I think we forget sometimes that we feel like these podcasts like Up and Vanished or, you know, The Agent or anything that we've done collectively, yes. High Strange, it feels like it takes a long time. Well, it does. <laughs> it does take a long time. But to actually make a TV series or a movie is can be a glacial process. Five or so of the imperative shows that I did. Yeah. Who, it, nothing was happening. It mm-hmm. was slow. This isn't the right fit. They're all like really close to having pilots done and, Damn, and, yeah. and making it happen. And then some of these new titles at Waveland, even before we take them out to the market, yeah, there's a big demand for these. And I think we lost sight of that in the podcast industry. And so right. I'm looking like at the... Like thinking beyond just right now and making another podcast yeah. and just churning those out and yeah. fucking being a factory. Yeah, I just... I, there's something exciting knowing... I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many of these will land, but being emboldened by Landman being a series that will come yeah, out. Yeah, to then, know that it could be bigger than what it was and that that, that dream's still alive. And then other things are following it. It feels like, for me, it's a moment in my life that has been like nothing else when I see, I don't know, just like all these, because getting back to the greater process a little bit, and trying to explain that uncomfortable, like, this is big for me, but I need to translate to, that to you mm-hmm. moment that we were talking about. One of the exercises I do go through is early on with the team, we actually make the show art and the deck and the visuals and all that stuff right at the beginning. Yeah. I, I want to make I, the movie. I've done that a lot too. I yeah. want. I just want to make the movie poster. Because if I can see it in a movie poster, yeah. I know what the show is. I know what the identity is. And and by the way, change your mind 10 times before the release. Sure. But I want people, when they look at any of the shows that I do, to feel like they've walked into a theater of really cool stories. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to love them all. But um, I think there's something there for you. I feel like what I, I experience every time I'm making a new show, every time it feels like I'm learning how to ride a bike again. I'm starting over from scratch and I get to this point where I'm just buried in it and I'm like, man, is this any good? Is this, is this the time I just put out a piece of shit show and everyone around me. So thank you guys. Like all my friends and peers, family is like, man, we know it's going to be good. And I go, and, and my response as of late has been like, okay, well, I appreciate that. But like I don't know that, like you know, like you have that faith in me. But I think what's not considered is is that I gotta think of it and do it, and I'm always fearful that like I'm gonna run out or something. It's almost, and maybe it's like a, an irrational idea, or maybe not. And you know, not everything's gonna be as good as the last or that, whatever. But it's like. I I feel like every year that goes by, I'm like, this my work needs to be getting better and I don't want to fall off. And my peers and friends have a lot of faith in me, which is thank you, yeah. everybody. But I'm also like, okay, well, that doesn't change that I think like I still don't know how to make this great. Yeah. And so I'm still I'm still making this shit up yeah yeah i'm giving it my best decision and gut instincts and let's go and i'm like we'll see but taking into account all that i've learned through everything that didn't work and did work and trying to infuse how i feel a little bit more into it in terms of like a more nuanced creative project that 
I don't know, can hit on levels that maybe my other ones didn't. Some a little stuff, bit more depth, you know? Some stuff is just not going to work. It's just the yeah. r- wrong time, wrong moment. It happens. And the stuff that didn't work for me was the moments when I got talked into a project that I, looking back, I really didn't believe in. I thought I was being a good corporate citizen. Right. And like, you kind of like sold yourself on it. But in hindsight, you're like, you know, when you believe in something and... Yeah. It's kind of like mine versus like, this is the team and there's nothing wrong with teamwork and like being part of the whatever. But sure, yeah. I kind of signed, I was, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's, if you guys believe it too, then let's do it. And they were the worst performing shows. It doesn't mean they were bad shows, mm-hmm. but they ended up being small shows mm-hmm. to our point earlier. Like it didn't fit all the check boxes that I wanted it to it made me feel good in another way that I was doing something good for the company and that or whatever. also equally as important as yeah. a creative, as a creator, I think, is... You don't want to be difficult. It's not being difficult or a yeah. jerk. It's just, yeah. you, you just have to have a standard. I hope that this conversation today has been a conversation about not to... to feel sorry for us or to pity us or to no. wow their their job really is hard because we have the best job in the world this is yeah. uh, like the the secrets out this i'm just is, taking that seriously to be this, honest this is a dream yeah but like at the end of the day you know we're just trying to do we're we're trying to you know we're trying to make stuff that people love that's important to them and you know sometimes the internet is a very hateful place and you have to have a sense of humor like you said so when i see comments of like you know, your voice sucks, boring, right. Yeah, too long, didn't read, you know, um, vocal fry. Right. Um, you know, it's... List goes on. And of course, great series, but it didn't solve the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to do? I mean, what I get the most is like, wow, he definitely knows, he certainly knows how to make this all about himself, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and and like you know, I don't even completely fault someone for thinking that because <laughs> I I could see how I would have a quick hot take on me and not know me and not really actually listen to the story though, and be like this guy's just doing it for this. Right. But it's like why am I even thinking that way? Yeah, it's just to me, it's how I know it's how I know how to tell a story. Yeah, and to me, I feel like it makes it feel more immersive, and it also makes me better at what I do. People want to root and for you. Not, Again, you're it's part not of as the deep experience. as you would wa- would like it to be if you're hating on it. Yeah. And it, sorry to upset you. It isn't. And I think that you don't want to believe that if you want to keep doing the other thing. And I'm all open. I'm open to criticism and reviews of my work and how I conduct myself. But it's a tired thought, I think. Um, and lazy. Well, well, here's where I've landed. Just in in that grand scheme of things um you don't have to like it just don't be a jerk about it that's all, that's just life i'm okay general, if right? you, i'm actually okay if you don't like it there's some there's a lot of shit i hate and guess what i am never near those things and i just decide. i never subscribe to them i never look at them i never talk to them i never hear them i stay away from the things that i hate yes what are you that's why talking I canceled about my twitter account eight eight nine yeah, years ago i don't right. need that exactly shit. smart move yeah i mean x <laughs> yeah whatever it is yeah yeah, yeah. exactly i'm done yeah so it's yeah it's it's not worth it so for the audience perspective i feel like this is our conversation every time we see each other yeah and in some way shape or form along with just oh, like absolutely we're catching fun. up and we're we're, we're commiserating yeah we're, here's we're celebrating together little micro wins yeah and, here's a cool sh- here's some cool shit i want you to hear or see yeah, or whatever yeah, it's like, like amping ourselves up and just ha- having fun with it yeah because we enjoy creating and it's a unique thing that we're doing and it feels cool to be able to connect on that at a real level because there's only so many people you can do that with and feel comfortable, vulnerable being around to do that with. I love what I do and I know you love what you do. Absolutely. And that's what makes this, hopefully the, the, the industry grow. The audience is still growing. They're still in love with podcasts and it's our responsibility to give them some really good shit. Right, exactly. Or like, or were we just sitting here wearing the podcaster costume, right. trying to, you know, play podcaster? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to do that. Not interesting. I want to break the rules over and over again. Yeah. Um. But this has been amazing, man. This is like, I thought we went to a lot of places, and honestly, just been a cathartic little 
conversation because I'm I'm in the thick of it now, and yeah. you are too. And um, feels good to talk about this. Well, cheers, man. It's been a blast. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcast, created and hosted by Payne Lindsay. For Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Co-executive producer is Mike Rooney. For iHeart Podcasts, executive producers are Matt Frederick and Alex Williams, with original music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Additional production by Mike Rooney, Dylan Harrington, Sean Nurney, Dayton Cole, and Gustav Wilde for Cohedo. Production support by Tracy Kaplan, Mara Davis, and Trevor Young. Mixing and mastering by Cooper Skinner and Dayton Cole. Our cover art was created by Rob Sheridan. Check out our website, talkingtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking to Death. This series is released weekly, absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, you can subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to tenderfootplus.com.